Well, the Japanese government says it won't scrap the relocation of a U.S. military base in Okinawa even after it was soundly rejected by the people in a referendum. A ruling party lawmaker has left his party in disgrace and resigned from the legislature amid allegations he raped a woman and his criminal trial is about to start. Shoveling snow. It's fun. It's good for you. It brings positive vibes from others. Well, that's what they're saying in snowy Fukushima Prefecture anyway. There's more child abuse in the news this week. Seems we can't go a week without it. We'll tell you another head-scratching tale coming up. The Japanese Space Agency successfully landed a craft on an asteroid 300 million miles from Earth, looking for clues to the universe's origins. And a Tokyo University has delivered the world's smallest healthy baby boy. You won't believe his size when you hear it. All this, plus Japan Today readers' comments and commentary coming up, so stick around. Hi, I'm Jeff Richards, and welcome once again to Japan This Week, a quick recap of stories we've been following on the Japan Today website. It's Friday, March 1st, 2019. In politics, our first story, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe says the controversial relocation of a U.S. military base in Okinawa will not be delayed despite a referendum on February 24th that saw voters soundly reject the move. Abe said it has been 20 years since Japan and the U.S. agreed to relocate the Futenma base and that it cannot be delayed any further. Now, his comments come after 72% of voters rejected the relocation plan in a non binding referendum they just held. The heavy U.S. military presence has frustrated local residents for decades with problems ranging from noise and military accidents like helicopter crashes and ship collisions to crime involving base residents. To ease tensions, the United States and Japan agreed in 1996 to move Futenma from its current heavily populated location to a more remote coastal site at Henoko, which is being built partly through land reclamation, which will become Camp Schwab. Opponents of the move want to see the base relocated outside of Okinawa, arguing responsibility for hosting U.S. troops should be more evenly spread across Japan. Currently, most of the U.S. military presence is in Okinawa and down in Atsugi and Yokosuka in Kanagawa. Okinawa residents have elected governors opposed to the move, including the current incumbent Danny Tamaki, who actually went on a trip to the United States last year as a sort of promotional tour for why the base should be moved. Abe said the government would continue holding a dialogue with the Okinawan people to gain their understanding of his decision to move forward with the relocation. Well, Japan Today readers weighed in on that. Yuri Otani says, Clearly the majority of the people of Okinawa are against the new airfield. The Americans and Japanese do not care about the opinion of the Okinawan people. The Americans only want free bases and the Japanese want the Americans anywhere but the home islands. Yubaru's view is this. This referendum should have been done decades ago. It should have been a message sent before things got this far along. Everyone prior to this, including Okinawan politicians, had their hands out for their cut. They wanted the money and Okinawa couldn't come to any conclusion. The national government has had enough and look, Futenma is going to close and the landfill at Schwab will be completed. Some good points there. Yeah, it's a very divisive subject. There's money involved. There's jobs involved. There's the local residents' concerns involved. I don't think we're going to get this thing sorted anytime soon. What do you think? Do you live in Okinawa? Have you been to Okinawa? Are you in the U.S. military stationed here in Japan? What do you think? Let us know at podcast at japantoday.com. Well, our next story is out of politics as well, but this one, I guess, is also crime, too. A former Liberal Democratic Party lawmaker, the LDP is the current party in power, has tended his resignation to the Diet, the Diet is the Japanese legislature, after facing pressure to do more than just quit the party over allegations that he raped a woman he was dating in December. Tsuyoshi Tabata, a 46-year-old three-time member of the House of Representatives who formerly worked at the Bank of Japan, resigned from the LDP last week, but criticism has been growing from both the ruling and opposition parties over the scandal. 
The woman has filed a criminal complaint against Tabata in Aichi Prefecture, alleging that he sexually assaulted her at her home while she was sleeping after a whining and dining session. Tabata is also suspected to have taken photos of the woman with his mobile phone while she was naked. The weekly magazine Shukan Bunshun has announced on its website that it will soon report yet another allegation of his alleged sexual misconduct. Now you need to visit us and stay tuned to Japan Today for that story when it's coming out. Tabata gets no sympathy from Japan Today readers. Ducoletto asks, So why is he not sitting in detention awaiting the outcome of the charges or court case? Why is he not a risk in tampering with evidence such as the photos he allegedly took with his mobile phone? Double standards, Japan? I think what Ducoletto is referring to here, of course, is Mr. Carlos Ghosn, who's currently sitting in detention and has been for a number of months for alleged financial misconduct at Nissan Motor Company. Now, Simon Faustin has an answer for Ducoletto. Well, naturally, the LDP and their lackeys will be on damage limitation mode to protect themselves. Friendly judges and prosecutors won't see it as being in the public interest to make the ruling party look bad by subjecting its members to the same kind of treatment other suspects get. Both very valid comments. I guess there are some perks that come with being a member of the ruling party, but Nobody's above the law, and we'll see what happens with the trial. What do you think? Let us know your thoughts at podcast at japantoday.com. In our crime section this week, sadly, we have yet another story of child abuse that is just as sad and, frankly, pathetic as the ones we've reported in recent weeks. Police in Kagoshima Prefecture have arrested a 31-year-old woman on suspicion of abusing her 8-year-old daughter in early February after she threw a TV remote control at her. Police said Saori Takano threw the remote control at her daughter, hitting her beneath the right eye. The girl had a swollen right eye and bruise on her face for about a week after the incident. Her grandfather then took her to a police station and said he was concerned that she was being abused. Police contacted child welfare authorities who took the girl into protective custody. Police quoted Takano as saying she lost her temper and threw the remote control but didn't mean for it to hit her daughter. They never do. Well, it turns out police have said that when the girl was in a nursery school in another city in 2012, she had burn marks on her body indicating she may have been abused regularly. Police visited Takano who told them her daughter had burned herself with a hot iron. Because kids always play with hot irons. Takano and her daughter moved to Kagoshima in 2013. In March of 2016, when the child was then in preschool, staff noticed what appeared to be burn marks on the girl. Police again questioned Takano, but didn't think the situation warranted taking the child into protective custody. Well, let's hear what Japan Today readers had to say. Sir Bentley 28 isn't impressed by the police. Reflecting on the fact that police questioned Takano but didn't think the situation warranted taking the child into protective custody, he or she suggests this is the main reason some of these kids either end up dead or abused to the brink of death. If it's a child abuse case, dig deep and drill the parents and question the kids separately because they might fear the parents. Absolutely true that, and you might recall this from our story last week. Disillusion says, The child welfare authorities have a pretty tough call to decide whether the child should be removed from their parents or parent. Of course, the abuse is terrible, but the alternative can be just as emotionally distressing for a child. They need to set up more counseling and education services for parents. These parents do not have the emotional stability or education to know how to discipline kids without lashing out at them in callous ways. Under the current system, the kids are victims either way. Damn straight, that's a good point. This woman in this story really needs some counseling. This cycle of not being able to properly discipline kids and then launching them out into adulthood without the skills to cope is why this cycle keeps continuing. Now, Yokai comments, Actually, I can understand why they didn't do anything at first. I burned myself a few times as well when I was a kid and once by my dad by accident. I had my hand near the ashtray and he was trying to put out a cigarette without looking. Some bruises are rather usual when you're a child. Well, I get that. Sometimes bruises are bruises. But when they're brought to the attention of teachers or authorities, they should be checked out. What do you think? Leave us a comment at podcast at japantoday.com. Well, in national news, we have a story out of Fukushima Prefecture, which for once 
doesn't have anything to do with the 2011 earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear disaster. While much of the country is just about to spring into cherry blossom season, other areas are still blanketed with heavy snow and chilly temperatures. Now, I don't know about you, but back in the day, I'm, I'm Canadian, shoveling snow from the driveways was not a joyous uh, activity. That was something that we had to do. And, you know, when my brother and my sisters and I went out there, well, that was definitely a chore. Much like raking the leaves or, you know, washing the dad's car or cutting the lawn or whatever, something you were made to do. Well, in the small town of Nishiaizu, in the snow country of northeastern Fukushima, snow shoveling is no longer a chore. Now, it's a fun winter season exercise for young people to burn off calories and gain appreciation from others. While removing snow from roofs and streets is commonly regarded as hard labor, I, okay, I wouldn't call it hard labor, I'd call them chores, but uh, okay, Mr. Editor, an organization in the town is encouraging people to see it in a more positive light and enjoy its benefits as a workout. Jose exercise. Jose, Jose exercise. Jose exercise. Something like that. It's a combination of a Japanese word, josetsu, which means snow removal, and exercise, jose exercise, which kind of doesn't sound like what we're talking about. Takeyuki Suzuki, 40, founded the Japan Jose Exercise Association in 2015. Sorry, I can't say that without laughing. He founded it with local officials and business representatives to promote snow shoveling as an exercise among young volunteers in the town of Nishiaizu, where half of its 6,000 residents are aged 65 or older. So far, about 400 people have taken part in the activity, which is much less than 50%, so I think somebody's got to pick up their game there. Anyway, the association advises people that they should take their time to warm up beforehand and cool down afterward while stressing its benefits, such as overcoming an activity, to say the least. It also gives effective tips on snow removal without getting injured, such as taking down snow little by little using shovels and avoiding doing it alone because it's so much more fun with others. The association has been expanding its activities and now provides a smartphone app which shows how many calories have been burned by users who take part in the exercise. And I'm sure that one's going to fly out of the app store. I mean, I'm downloading it right now. Let's hear from Japan Today Reader Zone to Surf. Well, I have to applaud the idea. It's easy to take pot shots at it, but if it helps even a little bit, that's a good thing. Snow shoveling is a lot of exercise, but it is also literally backbreaking work. So, pre-workout stretching is a good idea. Wonder if this also includes advanced snow removal exercise, aka roof snow removal. Well, you know, I'm no engineer or exercise guru, but I, th I think snow roof removal is when you just climb up on top of the roof, push some of that snow down, and hope you don't fall off. Kohaku Ebis cautions, anyone doing it should be warned that if you do use your lower back, it may introduce you to a whole new world of pain. Design a proper roof, and you should only have to climb on it in extreme snow events. We've not had a lot of snow this winter at my place, so I'm a bit out of shoveling practice. And he's probably an engineer, too, with his complaints about the design of roofs. So when you were younger, think, think back, way, way back, when you were raking the leaves or shoveling snow or mowing lawns, did you go out and go from door to door to your neighbors and uh, try to get a little bit of cash from doing that kind of stuff, you know, venture out into entrepreneurship? And if so, how much money did you make back then? I don't know. It's just a question that occurs to us. I mean, was it a little or a lot? Do you look back on it fondly now, or was it something that you absolutely dreaded to do? Well, we want to hear from you. Let us know, let us know, let us know. At podcast at japantoday.com. Sorry, I, I just had to do that. Well, in tech news this week, a Japanese probe... And no, we are not talking about proctology here. About the size of a large fridge, we're obviously not talking about proctology here, was sent to examine an asteroid about 300 million kilometers from the Earth for clues about the origin of life and the solar system. Well, it landed successfully 
last week. Data from the probe called Hayabusa 2 showed changes in speed and direction which indicated that it had touched down on the asteroid and was blasting back to its orbiting position, according to officials from the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, commonly known as JAXA. The probe fired a bullet into the asteroid to stir up surface matter, which it would then collect for analysis and send back to Earth. Well, actually bring back to Earth. The asteroid is thought to contain relatively large amounts of organic matter and water from some 4.6 billion years ago when the solar system was born. Now, scientists hope those samples may provide answers to some very fundamental questions about life and the universe, including whether elements from space helped give rise to life here on Earth. The Hayabusa 2 mission, with a price tag of around 30 billion yen, which is about 270 million US dollars, was launched in December 2014 and is scheduled to return to Earth with its samples in 2020. Hopefully just in time for the Olympics. That would be a great splash town as part of the opening events. Well, congratulations have poured in from Japan Today readers. Crazy Joe calls it wonderful, sending something far, far away to something tiny with brilliant, delicate precision. And folks, this is all built on science and research that sometimes looks to have no practical applications. The advancement of knowledge is just awesome. I hear your enthusiasm, Crazy Joe, and yeah, I kind of like it. Brownie adds... Quite insane that an object can be directed and fully controlled over 280 million kilometers and then land precisely on a couple of tatami mats, and even more so, collect samples and then take the arduous journey back to Earth and remain intact, they hope. Super science. That's right, Brownie. Super science. And also... Let me explain. Tatami mats are small flooring mats used here in Japanese houses that are about, I don't know, two and a half to three feet by two and a half to three feet. Pretty small. I don't know how you can't like that story. Sending something from right here on Earth all the way out to the edge of the solar system and land it on a small asteroid and then bring it back home safely. That is phenomenal. That is, of course, unless they're not filming this all on a soundstage in Tokyo. What do you think? Send us your thoughts to podcast at japantoday.com. Well, we finished this week's program with something from the National News section and another human triumph, this time in medicine. Keio University in Tokyo says a baby with a birth weight of 268 grams, that's just under 10 ounces, has returned home healthy from its hospital after increasing to a weight of 3,238 grams, or slightly over 7 pounds, becoming the smallest boy in the world to have survived such a birth weight. Now, the baby was at first so small that he could be fit into an adult's cupped hands. But after being treated in a neonatal intensive care unit at the hospital by managing his breathing and nutrition, he grew steadily and became able to breastfeed. There have been 23 babies worldwide who were prematurely born weighing under 300 grams and survived, but only four of those were boys, according to the Tiniest Babies Registry. Now, this website's out of the University of Ohio, and it actually exists. The Tiniest Babies website. You really should check it out. The boy from Tokyo was born through an emergency C-section in August as his weight didn't increase at 24 weeks gestation and doctors judged his life was in danger, the university said. He left the hospital last Wednesday, two months after the initial due date. Well, the news has delighted, of course, the parents and the family, but even Japan Today readers are weighing in. Goldorak remarks, Reckon the baby could fit in the palm of my hand. 268 grams. I have eaten bigger steaks. Advancement in healthcare and medicine is such a wonderful thing. Absolutely, Goldorak, but, you know, you're comparing it to a steak, which is something that you eat, which, I don't know, it's kind of a weird comparison, but I get what you're getting at there. And from Toasted Heretic, it's always good to read stories like this. Stories of humanity, rescue, science, inspiration and tales that brighten one's day. Wow. Toasted Heretic, you just summed it up, and I think I'm going to let you have the last word.
And that was a quick recap of the news from Japan this week for this Friday, March 1st, 2019, or 2019, whichever way you want to say it. Thanks to the Japan Today editors for curating this week's story. Thanks to Kamasami Kong for his production help. And mostly, thanks to you, all of our listeners, for continuing to tune in each week. You can find links to all of the news mentioned in this podcast in the show notes. And since the news from Japan, well, you know it never stops, you can... And you should visit the Japan Today website anytime at japantoday.com. If you want to get us on the socials, you can follow us on Twitter at, at @japantoday for all of the breaking stories, or follow us on Instagram. Our handle is Japan Today News. From the Japan Today Newsroom at G Plus Media in Tokyo, I'm Jeff Richards, and join us again next week with a quick recap of Japan's biggest and smallest, like really smallest, like the teeniest in the world. Stories. Sayonara, folks. Yeah.